The Monitor Some people have a clear vision of their future from a young age. Personally, I always knew that regardless of my chosen profession, my ultimate purpose in life was to be a mother. Growing up as the youngest of three children and the only girl, I often found myself in the role of the baby. My oldest brother, Corbin, was born a year after my parents got married, followed by my second brother, Lane, just 14 months later. My mom secretly hoped for a girl when Lane was born, as they initially planned to have only two children. I never miss an opportunity to tease him about this, however, for years later. They were surprised by the arrival of a bouncing baby girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. They named me Rowan Quinn, after my dad's grandmother, but I've always been called by my middle name, Quinn. My dad, Dalton Vaughn, worked as a professor at a community college in a neighboring town, while my mom worked as a receptionist at a law firm just a few miles from our house. After I was born, my mom decided to quit her job and stay at home until I started school. Once I began my education, she took on a part-time position at a hotel near the highway entrance in our town. We were what you would consider a typical family. We went on yearly vacations together and celebrated important holidays by attending church as a family. We believed our parents had the perfect marriage. Therefore, it was devastating when, at the age of seven, my parents sat us down and informed us they were getting a divorce. We were completely blindsided and confused. In the aftermath, my brothers chose to live with my dad. While I wanted to stay with my mom, consequently, we spent a significant portion of our childhoods shuttling between households on weekends and holidays. This arrangement strained my relationship with my dad and brothers, although neither of my parents remarried. They both had multiple unsuccessful relationships, which was particularly challenging during my formative years. As soon as I turned 13, I dedicated all my spare time to babysitting children in our neighborhood. Through this, I managed to save up a considerable amount of money. Caring for little ones provided a comforting escape from the turmoil in my life. I eagerly anticipated the day when I would have a child of my own. However, babysitting gradually transformed from a side job into a hobby during my sophomore year of high school when I met Bryce Carter, a popular and attractive red-headed junior. Bryce had recently transferred from another local school and worked at the town library, where I often spent my free nights engrossed in the horror novels I love to read. We became inseparable from the moment we met. Our relationship quickly became serious. And the summer after I graduated from high school, Bryce surprised me by getting down on one knee in front of my entire family and proposing. We got married in a small yet beautiful ceremony at the Langville Banquet Center just outside of town in February of the following year. It was a priority for me to start our family right away, but I knew we needed to finish college and secure decent jobs first. Bryce was already in his third year of studying physical therapy at our town's hospital campus when we got married. He completed his studies the following spring and was immediately offered a job at the hospital. Meanwhile, I had just been accepted into a local college for business finance. While waiting to start college, I applied for jobs at different banks to gain experience. To my surprise, I received a call from a bank across town offering me an interview for the position of personal banking associate in training. It was an excellent opportunity as they were willing to provide training and certification through their own classes given the circumstances. I couldn't turn it down and withdrew from the college I had been accepted to. Things were going well for us and we started thinking it might be the right time to start expanding our family. Unfortunately, after a long and frustrating year of unsuccessful attempts to conceive, my doctor recommended running some tests. I was devastated to learn that I had a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, and my doctor wasn't certain if I could even carry children. We explored our options and decided to give fertility treatments a try. We underwent several rounds of treatment with no success. Just as I was on the verge of losing hope, 
We were pleasantly surprised to see two little pink lines on a pregnancy test just before New Year's. We were overwhelmed with joy and immediately shared the news with everyone. I started purchasing various pregnancy reading materials and became vigilant about my diet and activities. However, about a month later, our happiness turned into sorrow as I experienced a miscarriage for unknown reasons. To make matters worse, I lost my job that same month due to company budget cuts. I felt myself sinking into a deep depression and believed that my dreams of motherhood were shattered. Thankfully, Bryce was my rock. He constantly reassured me of his unwavering love and support, never allowing me to give up on our dreams of having a family. We agreed to give the treatments one final attempt before considering the expensive option of in vitro fertilization, which we knew we couldn't afford. I vividly remember counting down the days until I could take another pregnancy test. Those weeks were the most anxious and nerve-wracking of my life. Adding to the pressure, our third anniversary was approaching, and I desperately wanted this to be our moment. I paced in the bathroom, staring at the blinking digital stick, trying not to raise my hopes to high. I kept telling myself that no matter the outcome, everything would be okay. When I emerged from the bathroom, clutching the pregnancy test, Bryce's heart sank as he saw the sadness etched on my face. He immediately reached out to comfort me, assuring me once again of his unwavering love, handing him the test. I anxiously watched his expression transform from concern to disbelief as he read the word pregnant in bold letters. Tears of cautious joy streamed down our faces, and we made a pact to keep the news to ourselves until the pregnancy was further along and deemed viable. The weeks leading up to the first ultrasound felt like an eternity. We anxiously awaited the moment of truth, praying silently as we stared at the monitor, hoping for positive news. The doctor meticulously pointed out each detail on the screen, and impatience consumed my thoughts. Get to the good part already, I silently urged. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, about five minutes into the ultrasound, the words we had longed to hear for three arduous years were spoken, and there are the nice, strong heartbeats. Everything looks perfect. Overwhelmed with relief, we were initially to stunned to grasp the significance of the doctor's words. Wait, what? Did you say heartbeats? I practically shouted. The doctor grinned at our astonishment and delivered the news. Congratulations. You're having twins. Our shock was beyond measure. I was flooded with a mix of joy, relief, anxiety, panic, and every possible emotion that accompanies first-time motherhood, multiplied by two. Surprisingly, the first trimester went smoother than expected. I experienced no nausea and gained minimal weight. Friends and family found it hard to believe we were expecting twins given the ease of those initial months. However, the following months proved to be a different story altogether. Merely the thought of food made me queasy, yet I managed to gain weight at a rapid pace, sometimes one to three pounds per week. My back ached, my feet swelled, and sleep eluded me, as I found myself waking up every three hours to use the bathroom. Due to the twins being conceived through fertility treatments, we had bi-weekly doctor visits, although it was somewhat inconvenient. The frequent updates and glimpses of our babies provided a sense of relief. At the 16-week appointment, we received another delightful surprise. The babies were positioned perfectly to reveal their genders. Baby A was a girl, and Baby B was a little boy. We were overjoyed. It was the best possible outcome, especially considering that future pregnancies were unlikely for us. With the knowledge of their genders in hand, it was time to prepare. We realized there were countless things we needed to learn about and acquire. The stress began to take its toll on me both emotionally and physically, recognizing my need for a break. My amazing mother surprised me with a mother-daughter spa day. We indulged in facials, massages, manicures, pedicures, and a relaxing dinner afterward. 
It was precisely the rejuvenation I needed. We shared laughter, discussed motherhood, and reminisced about cherished memories from my childhood. My mother mentioned the times when I accompanied her to visit a psychic advisor many years ago. She recalled how during one of those visits, the psychic had gestured towards me and asked if she was aware that I possessed the gift of sixth sense. At that time, I had no understanding of what it meant. However, over the years, people had often described me as intuitive, and I had developed a fascination with all things supernatural. In a sudden burst of inspiration, I blurted out, Let's go see a psychic. My mother chuckled at my outburst, but soon realized I was serious. Are you serious? she asked. Absolutely. I've always wanted to go for myself, and maybe she could provide insights about the babies, I replied. Little did I know that this decision would mark the beginning of a chilling ordeal for me and my family. It was a dark July evening, which seemed fitting as my mom, and I drove along the long country roads towards the home of her psychic advisor, Tessa Cohen. Tessa still lived in her grand and historic estate, and it had been years since I had last been there. As we approached the massive estate, the gravel path and the tall trees and flowers lining the driveway felt familiar. However, I couldn't help but notice the absence of neighboring houses which made me wonder if it was ever unsettling for Tessa to live so far away from others. Then again, she communicated with the deceased, so what could be scarier than that? Rain started to fall as we walked up to the large concrete porch and rang the bell. I couldn't help but admire the intricate architectural details of the estate. The white marble columns on either side of the stoop were beautifully crafted and I found myself reaching out to touch one, as I had done as a child, curious about the history these walls held. As my eyes traveled up to the second-floor balcony that overlooked the property, I daydreamed about what life must have been like when the house was first built. I imagined a wealthy family with many children, exploring the halls and playing in the rooms filled with countless toys, accompanied by a staff catering to their every need. Animals of all kinds would roam the grounds, and laughter and happiness would fill the air. But alongside that, I sensed a tinge of sadness. This house had likely witnessed its fair share of grief and darkness. Sensing my surprise, she quickly clarified, Don't be too impressed. Dot, dot, dot. Your mom told me over the phone when she made the appointment. I breathed a sigh of relief, realizing it was just a simple explanation. Oh, of course, thank you, I sheepishly replied. We followed Tessa through the familiar beaded curtain that led into her parlor, where she conducted her readings. The furniture had been updated, but the room remained largely unchanged. The slate gray walls and the black and gray swirled carpet were just as I remembered them from my childhood. The fragrance of incense, which she always burned, filled the air momentarily transporting me back to those days when I patiently waited for my mom to seek advice and guidance from Tessa. Now, it was my turn. As I sat down on the red crushed velvet oversized couch next to my mom, a wave of nervousness washed over me. I couldn't help but wonder what Tessa was going to reveal. What if she sent something wrong with one or both of the babies? What if she foresaw any danger befalling me? my husband, or anyone else for that matter. Doubts began to cloud my mind, and I started questioning whether coming here had been a mistake. I wasn't sure if I was ready to hear what Tessa had to say. With hesitation, I settled into the couch, waiting anxiously. I watched Tessa enter the room, walking slowly, closing her eyes, and taking a deep breath, as she exhaled and opened her eyes. A warm smile spread across her face as she took a seat in the black leather chair opposite us. I nervously scanned the room, avoiding direct eye contact with Tessa, hoping she would begin the conversation with my mom first. Perhaps that would give me a chance to mentally prepare for whatever news she was about to share. Seemingly aware of my unease, Tessa shifted her gaze towards my mom and started with, So, Annabelle... 
The last time we spoke, many years ago, I saw you finding love after your divorce. How have things been going for you? As my mother proceeded to recount the details of her numerous failed relationships over the past two decades, I playfully caressed my swollen belly. The babies had been still until now, but my touch seemed to awaken them. They started moving so vigorously that their kicks were visible from the outside. I let out a little giggle as one jab tickled me right under the ribs. Tessa and my mom abruptly paused their conversation, their attention drawn to me. I was about to apologize for the interruption when Tessa's expression turned serious, and she asked, How much do you know about the neighborhood you live in? A chill ran down my spine, and my face turned pale as blood drained from it. W-H-A dot 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 what do you mean? I stammered. Without missing a beat, she responded, My spirit guide has alerted me to a potential danger on your street, something you may not even be aware of. I don't have all the details, but how well do you know your neighbors? Her gaze was intense, her lips pursed, and her expression a mix of thoughtfulness and sternness, as if she expected an answer, caught off guard by the question. I scrambled to recall any information about our neighborhood that could shed light on her warning. Just before we got married, we purchased a modest two-bedroom ranch home. It wasn't extravagant, but it served as a perfect starter house for a newlywed couple. Our street consisted of approximately 10 homes, and we were acquainted with most of our neighbors. To one side lived a retired couple in their 60s, Gabe and Linda Schmidt. They mostly kept to themselves, but often checked in on us and offered assistance when needed. On the other side was an elderly widow named Vivian. We had only exchanged a few words with her as she had limited mobility, making her less visible in the neighborhood. Across from us resided Savannah Lewis, a school teacher at the local high school who happened to know my parents from their school days. She was incredibly friendly and frequently engaged in conversations with us. We jokingly referred to her as the neighborhood watch since she seemed to be aware of everything happening on our street and kept us informed. Next to Savannah lived Kent, a quiet middle-aged man. Although he greeted us with a smile or wave, I didn't know much about him. I assumed he lived alone, as I never saw anyone else with him. He had very daily routines, leaving me uncertain about his occupation on pleasant days. He could be spotted riding one of his two motorcycles. The remaining neighbors consisted mostly of elderly couples or young couples like us. It was a peaceful street, and we had never encountered any reports of theft, violence, or any kind of crime. We always felt secure in our community. Quinn, Tessa's voice broke my train of thought. I blinked, refocusing on the room. As she continued speaking, I didn't mean to alarm you. I receive information, and it's my responsibility to pass it along dot dot dot. Can you think of any reason why your neighborhood might be unsafe? All I could manage was shaking my head. My mom reached over and took hold of my hand, offering support. Sweetie, are you all right? She asked, swallowing hard and clearing my throat. I hoped my voice would remain steady as I replied, Yeah, I'm fine. And no, I can't think of any reason it would be unsafe, but I'll certainly be more vigilant now. Thank you for letting me know. I took a deep breath and forced a smile. After what felt like an eternity, Tessa finally broke the silence and spoke again. Her words caught me off guard, and I could see the confusion on her face. Your grandpa is here with us, Quinn, she said. Her brow furrowed. She paused for a moment and continued. He's showing me something about a baby being with him dot dot dot. Was there a pregnancy that was lost? I fought back the emotions welling up inside me as I managed to reply, Yes, right before this one. I knew she must be referring to my dad's father, Everett. We had been close when I was growing up, but he had passed away from a stroke just before my high school graduation. Losing him had been tough, but I always felt his presence. Sometimes, I even had imaginary conversations with him in my mind. 
It was oddly comforting to know that Tessa could sense him too. He says the baby is safe with him now, and not to worry. These babies will be healthy and beautiful. I nodded, biting my lip to hold back tears, and looked away. Well, that's comforting to know. Thank you, I managed to say, my voice choked with emotion. The rest of the reading proceeded uneventfully, thankfully. Tessa mentioned a potential promotion for Bryce at the hospital. I desperately hoped she was right, because we had been stressed about our finances since the pregnancy began. She continued speaking with my mom about her immediate future, but truthfully, I wasn't fully paying attention. I was still trying to process what Tessa had already revealed. By the time we left, I felt emotionally and physically drained. All I wanted was to go home, lie down, and share everything Tessa had told me with Bryce. We expressed our gratitude to Tessa and paid her for her time. Just as we approached the front door, she placed her hand on my shoulder. I halted abruptly and turned to face her. Do you know someone named Claire or Claris? Or a similar sounding name, she asked. I pondered for a moment, but no specific names came to mind. No, I can't think of anyone, I replied, shaking my head. Tessa paused, as if awaiting a response from an unseen source. Hum dot dot dot, has anyone on your husband's side of the family been sick? Or have there been any heart-related issues, she inquired. Not that we're aware of, I informed her. Why? I'm not sure, she replied thoughtfully. I'm being told that there is something concerning the heart of an older female that you need to be aware of. I simply stared back at her. Why died? It was such an unexpected and peculiar statement. I wasn't sure how to process this information. The ride home with my mom was filled with silence. It seemed she was just as unsure of what to say. When I shared my experience with Tessa with Bryce, he appeared completely unfazed. He had always been skeptical about anything supernatural and had dismissed the idea of me visiting a psychic from the start. You're really going to take advice from someone who claims they're receiving messages from the beyond. Do you realize how crazy that sounds, he had said when the idea was first proposed? Consequently, he didn't place any value in what Tessa had said. However, I wasn't so quick to dismiss it. Little did we know, we would soon discover the true meaning behind Tessa's messages and the terrifying ordeal that awaited us. Bryce's skepticism was about to be put to the ultimate test. Life continued on as usual after that, and I soon put the visit with Tessa to the back burner for now. I had too much going on to worrying about what could or couldn't happen at the moment. We had finally finished registering for baby items. And we had even gone out and bought the baby's cribs and bedding. We decided on a teddy bear theme in pastel colors. Bryce and his dad, Neil, painted the walls beige to match the bedding, and the ceiling was blue with white clouds. I found myself spending a lot of time in that room. Mostly, I just sat in the rocking chair my grandmother gave us, daydreaming about the day I would finally have my babies home and safe in my arms. The doctor visits were going great. Both babies looked healthy and right on track. By 30 weeks, they were already estimated to be over 3 pounds each. We even got to see a few 3DO for D pictures of them, which was amazing. Bryce and I argued over which one of us they looked more like. Another thing we couldn't seem to agree on was what their names would be. We had looked through every name in our 10,000 baby names book and neither of us could find a boy and girl name that we both loved. Bryce like either Audrey and Adrian or Mason and Madison. My top two favorites were Lexa and Lucian or Hadley and Hayden. After many dead-end discussions on the subject, we just agreed that we have to wait until they were born to see what names best suited them. One Saturday afternoon in my seventh month, my mom, along with Bryce's mom, Maris, and sister, Lucy, 
surprised me by throwing us a huge baby shower at their church. All of our friends and family were there. And I could tell from the elaborate pink and blue decorations everywhere, the giant diaper cakes, the welcome baby's banner, and tables overflowing with food and gifts, that they had put a lot of time and thought into doing this for us. It was incredible, and I don't think there was a single thing from our registry that wasn't bought. We got our double stroller from my parents. And my best gal friends got together and made a basket of baby essentials and things for the hospital. Bryce's grandma, Claudia, gave the babies the most adorable blue and pink teddy bears. They were holding white, plush hearts that she hand-stitched with the words Granny's Angel on them in gold. But my favorite gift, by far, had to be the last gift I opened. Bryce's parents and younger sister bought us our video monitor for the nursery. I had wanted it so badly, but I didn't think anyone would actually buy it for us. I couldn't wait to get home and set it up in the nursery. Later that night, we unloaded all the gifts and were trying to figure out where to put everything. I sorted the clothes to be washed and Bryce installed the camera in the corner of the nursery, aimed down at the cribs. After we charged the monitor for about an hour, we turned it on to see how it worked. I had never seen anything like it. There was a night vision mode that was just as clear even with all the lights off. There was a camera camcorder mode that allowed you to take still pictures or video for up to 10 hours and upload it through your computer. There was also a talk back function where you held down a button and spoke into it and your voice could be heard in the nursery. And it was noise activated, so it would come on any time the babies fussed or moved. It could even pan the room and zoom in on a certain spot. We must have been playing with it for well over an hour. When I suddenly realized just how exhausted I was, more so than I had been in a long time. I was also having some mild cramping, which tended to happen when I overdid it or if I hadn't had enough fluids. I decided to have some tea and then go to the bathroom before heading to bed. When I got to the bathroom, however, I noticed that I was had started to bleed fairly heavily. And my cramps had started getting progressively worse. I screamed for Bryce. And when he came running and saw what was happening, his panic look matched the one on my own face. What do I do? He yelled. Call Dr. Hellman and see if he can meet us at the hospital. I cried. I cannot have these babies yet. In what felt like a matter of minutes, we found ourselves in the lobby of the emergency room, being hurried into a room. Bryce took care of the paperwork, while nurses examined me and bombarded me with countless questions. Dr. Hellman arrived about 20 minutes later. Still dressed in his street clothes, he exchanged a few words with the nurse outside my room before coming in to perform an ultrasound. This time, he remained quiet and didn't allow us to see the screen. I stared at Bryce, gripping his hand tightly as tears streamed down my face. Please, God, I silently begged, please let these babies be okay. Finally, Dr. Hellman broke the silence. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that the babies seem to be doing fine, and you're not in labor yet, I felt an immense sense of relief wash over me. Well, thank goodness, I exclaimed. But what's the bad news? He turned the monitor towards us, pointing to a dark area on the screen, and said, the bad news is that you have what's called a placental abruption here, where you see this dark spot. It means that a small section of the fetal sac is detaching from the uterine wall. That's what caused the bleeding, without missing a beat, Bryce asked, okay. So what do we do now? I had never seen him look so concerned. Essentially, we were informed that these situations could resolve themselves, but it would require strict bed rest for the remainder of my pregnancy. I wasn't thrilled about it, but it was certainly better than the alternative of potentially losing our babies. Some people might view bed rest as an opportunity to let others do everything for you, but for me, it was even more challenging than I had anticipated. I was only allowed to get up for meals or to use the bathroom. 
I couldn't even think about leaving the house unless it was for my now weekly doctor appointments. Obviously, I couldn't engage in any heavy lifting or exercise. However, I did teach myself how to crochet and started making blankets for the twins. Apart from that, I spend most days on the couch watching daytime talk shows and reality programs like Ellen and Dancing with the Stars. I particularly enjoyed watching baby shows on TLC, such as Bringing Home Baby and A Baby Story. No matter the episode, they always made me cry. I read and reread my What to Expect book countless times to the point where I could probably recite the third trimester chapter from memory. Thankfully, I had visitors who helped pass the time. My mom came over almost every night, and our immediate family and friends joined us on weekends to assist in completing the nursery. Without them, we probably wouldn't have finished it in time. The bleeding had ceased the day after our visit. Which was a relief. So my appointments thereafter were mainly to monitor my progress and ensure no new complications arose. On the morning of October 30th, one month into my bed rest and 36 weeks into the pregnancy, I went in for what I expected to be a routine checkup. The nurse checked my vital signs, including my pulse and blood pressure. 160 over 100. Your blood pressure seems a bit high today. Are you feeling okay? She asked. I think so. I replied. Just tired as usual, but otherwise fine. I had been experiencing Braxton Hicks contractions quite frequently in the past few days. They weren't unbearable, so I assumed they were just a normal part of the process and didn't mention them. When Doctor Hellman entered the room, the first thing he did was examine my feet. How long have your feet been this swollen? He inquired. I shrug. I hadn't even noticed. It's not like I could see them any more anyway. Why is something wrong? I asked. Well, your elevated blood pressure and swelling in your feet could be indicators that something is going on. But I'd like to finish your exam before deciding what to do next. I sighed heavily and kept telling myself to remain calm as I lay back onto the exam table. Less than a minute into the exam, I heard Doctor Hellman say, "Well, what do you know? You're already three centimeters dilated. How would you feel about having to new bundles of joy within the next day or so?" I just looked at him in shock, not even sure how to respond. Looking over at Bryce. It was obvious he was feeling the exact same way. A million thoughts went through my mind at once. Was it too early for the babies to be born? Would they be ready and healthy? We hadn't even thought to bring the bag we'd packed for the hospital. Doctor Hellman explained that he wanted to medically induce me to get the labor process going quickly, and he assured me that most sets of multiples are born weeks before they're due because of the lack of room in the womb. And barring any unforeseen complications during the labor or delivery, they should be perfectly fine. When Bryce and I finally wrapped our heads around what was happening, we called our families to let them know. Within the hour, I was registered and in a labor or delivery room. I was hooked up to several monitors, which kept track of both baby's heartbeats and my contractions. They had started my for fluids and the labor-inducing meds. By that time, Bryce's parents and my mom had arrived. My mom was immediately at my side, asking if she could do anything. She said my dad was headed straight there from work, which was about twenty minutes away, so it shouldn't be too long. My brothers were both working late at the auto repair shop they ran together. They told my mom they'd be there as soon as they closed the shop, and Bryce's sister, Lucy. Was in the middle of rehearsal for the high school competitive dance team she was on, so I knew she'd be there as soon as she got the voicemail. About an hour and a half later, around 6:30 p.m., my contractions were in full swing. The nurse said I had only progressed to four centimeters, and they wouldn't do the epidural until I was at least five centimeters. Bryce's parents were pacing the room anxiously. While Bryce and my mom sat on either side of me, 
letting me squeeze their hands whenever the contractions were really strong. By 8 p.m., the pain had become completely unbearable with each contraction. I buzzed the nurse, who came in and checked me once more. I was finally to 5 centimeters, and they called the anesthesiologist in for my epidural. Now, many women I know have warned me about the horrible sting from the large needle in your spine during an epidural, but let me tell you, it was a godsend. Within a half hour, I could barely feel anything from the waist down. It was a strange sensation, though. Like my lower half was asleep, I could still feel the pressure of the contractions, but it was nowhere near the pain I was feeling before. Actually, I was able to close my eyes and relax for a bit. I hadn't even realized I'd fallen asleep, but when I opened my eyes again, it was already past 10 p.m. Corbin, Lane, and Lucy had arrived and were quietly talking to one another. They looked over at me when they saw that I was awake. I was just starting to ask them how long they had been here. When I felt my water breaking, I started to panic as I buzzed the nurse to tell her. Everyone except Bryce and my mom left the room while the nursing staff cleaned me up and examined me again. Wow, the nurse said, you are almost fully dilated, my dear. In just a few minutes, I'll call the doctor and let him know it's time to push. All I could do was look at her and then at Bryce, this was IT. The moment I'd been waiting my whole life for was finally almost here. We were in the home stretch, and in just a short while, we would be looking into the faces of our new son and daughter. Our families came in one last time to give me a quick hug and kiss and wish me luck. I think I even saw tears in my dad's eyes as he hugged me and whispered, Good luck, baby girl. I'll be waiting just outside the door if you need anything. See you and those beautiful babies soon. My dad is not an emotional guy, so to hear him say that immediately got me choked up. Like I didn't already have enough emotions to deal with. Dr. H came in as my dad was leaving the room. So, I hear we are ready to push, he said. I guess so. I replied shakily with tears streaming down my face. My mom and Bryce were still standing on either side of the bed while they got me situated, and then Dr. H said, Okay, let's see what you've got. With each contraction that followed, I gave it everything I had. It felt like it was taking forever. But finally, after almost an hour of pushing, my beautiful baby girl was born at 12.01 a.m. Halloween morning. She didn't look quite as small as I worried she might, and shortly after Bryce cut the umbilical cord, she started wailing at the top of her lungs. It was such a relief to hear her and know she was all right. Bryce, my mom, and I couldn't help crying tears of joy. Bryce leaned down, kissed me, and whispered, You did it. She's perfect. I love you. Okay, now, one down, one to go. Dr. H said as the nurses took our daughter out of the room to get her cleaned up and checked out. For the next half hour, I continued to push with very little progress. The doctor was starting to become concerned because the baby's heart rate was dipping low with each push. He kept encouraging me and trying different positions in hopes of better progress. After another half hour and still no progress, I was completely exhausted. I heard the doctor sigh and say, well, I really didn't want to have to do this, but I can see that you're exhausted. And I'm worried that the lack of progress may be due to the cord being wrapped around the baby's neck at this point. I don't think we have a choice but to perform an emergency C-section. No, this was one of my biggest fears going into this pregnancy. I definitely did not feel prepared for this. But I was so worn out, and knew I couldn't go on pushing. So I broke down into sobs and simply said, Okay, let's just get this over with. They wheeled my bed quickly through the hallway, past our waiting family, who were clearly as shaken up as I was about the emergency surgery. My mom and dad gave me one more hug and kiss on my way to the operating room. 
while Bryce put on his scrub gown so he could be with me during the surgery. The whole process was absolutely terrifying. I couldn't see or feel a thing that they were doing. I could hear them talking and barking orders to the surgery staff. I could feel tugging, and occasionally the doctor would inform me about what they were doing. The good thing is, once they were in, it didn't take long before they got to the baby. I heard the assisting doctor confirm that the cord was, in fact, wrapped around his neck. And we have a baby boy, born at 1.23 a.m. I heard the doctor say, as he held him up for me to see. He looked really pale, and I realized I was holding my breath, listening intently for his first cry. I heard nothing. What's wrong? I asked Bryce, why isn't he crying? I yelled to the doctors. I heard them suctioning something as Dr. H replied. He's got some fluid in his lungs that's preventing him from breathing. Give it just another minute. I squeezed Bryce's hand even tighter and closed my eyes. Praying harder than I'd ever prayed before. Every second that went by felt like a lifetime. I was just about to break down again when I heard a little cough, followed by a high-pitched squeal as my baby boy let out his first cry. The relief I felt in that moment was indescribable. Bryce followed the baby and nurses out of the room while I stayed behind to be stitched up. I spent about two hours in recovery before I was taken back to my room with my awaiting family and new babies. I couldn't believe how beautiful they were. They were absolutely perfect. All the struggles, the heartache, the worrying, and the pain had been completely worth every second to finally see these two amazing little miracles. And we proudly introduced them to our family as Hadley Emerson and Hayden Gage. The recovery process was rough and extremely painful. I was in the hospital a total of five days just to make sure that the babies and I were healthy enough and ready for the trip home. I barely slept the entire time I was there, and not just because the babies kept me up. We constantly had family and friends coming and going, bringing even more gifts for the babies. Everyone remarked how cute Hadley and Hayden were, and how much they resembled both Bryce and I, from his red hair to my blue eyes. The nursing staff took wonderful care of the three of us, and even gave Bryce and me a crash course on caring for twins. From bathing and diapering, to feeding and swaddling. When we were finally released from the hospital, I was still pretty nervous about being a first-time mom caring for two babies at once, but I felt much more prepared than I had five days ago. Bryce followed the baby and nurses out of the room while I stayed behind to be stitched up. I spent about two hours in recovery before I was taken back to my room, where my family and the new babies awaited. I couldn't believe how beautiful they were. They were absolutely perfect. All the struggles, heartache, worrying, and pain had been completely worth it to finally see these two amazing little miracles. We proudly introduced them to our family as Hadley Emerson and Hayden Gage. The recovery process was rough and extremely painful. I stayed in the hospital for a total of five days to ensure the babies and I were healthy enough and ready to go home. I barely slept during that time, and it wasn't just because the babies kept me awake. We had constant visits from family and friends who brought even more gifts for the babies. Everyone remarked on how cute Hadley and Hayden were and how much they resembled both Bryce and me, from his red hair to my blue eyes. The nursing staff took wonderful care of the three of us and even gave Bryce and me a crash course on caring for twins, from bathing and diapering to feeding and swaddling. When we were finally released from the hospital, I was still pretty nervous about being a first-time mom, taking care of two babies at once, but I felt much more prepared than I had five days ago. Now, if only we had been as prepared for what awaited us when we arrived home. It was a relief to finally be heading home with our new additions. Even though it was November, the weather couldn't have been nicer, and I watched the twins sleep in their car seats throughout the whole drive. I was still extremely sore, but in that moment, I couldn't have been happier. 
However, as soon as we turned onto our street, my happiness was overshadowed by confusion. What greeted us were two police cars, an ambulance, and even a local news crew van parked across the street in front of Kent's house. We had no idea what was going on, but we knew we probably wouldn't get close enough to find out any time soon. Savannah, our neighbor, was in her driveway talking to one of the police officers. She looked pretty shaken up, so we knew it had to be something bad. We pulled into our driveway and got out of the car, still watching all the commotion. We couldn't make out what anyone was saying. Once we were all inside the house, Bryce said, "Stay in here with the kids while I go across the street to talk to Savannah and see what the heck is going on." I watched from our picture window as he hurried over to Savannah's house. I looked again at Kent's house. I hadn't seen Kent anywhere yet, but I noticed that there was police tape around his front door with the words "caution: do not enter" on it. What could have possibly happened? Bryce was talking to Savannah, and I noticed his gaze fixed in the direction of Kent's house, his hands on top of his head, shaking it in disbelief. He glanced back at me. His face had become ashen. My stomach turned as I watched him walk slowly back to our house. His hand shoved into his jeans pockets, never taking his eyes off the pavement until he reached our front door. What he was about to tell me would change our lives forever. As I mentioned before, I never knew much about Kent's backstory, but as Bryce relayed the news to me that day, I learned more than I ever wanted to know. It turns out that the polite and quiet neighbor. Who had smiled and waved to us for the last three years had been hiding a terribly dark secret. I need you to listen and let me finish before you completely freak out," Bryce said to me when he finally came back in. I stared back at him, wishing he'd just hurry up and spit it out, yet not knowing if I even wanted to hear what he had to say. Our neighbor, Kent, he's dead. He shot himself in the head a few nights ago. My jaw literally dropped open as he continued on. Apparently, a friend of his hadn't heard from him in a few days, and when he didn't answer his phone or door, they called the cops. When they got to the house, they found his body. Oh my gosh, how awful! I gasped, but by the look on his face, I could tell the story wasn't over. There's more, he said, taking a deep breath before continuing. After searching the house, they also found drugs stashed everywhere. Oh, so that must be why the news crew is here then? I interrupted. No, unfortunately, it gets much worse. Apparently, they also found some items belonging to two local missing children. They were in a box along with the news article about the missing children. I felt sick. I knew exactly which children he was referring to. I remembered hearing that story. I saw their mother on the news pleading for the safe return of her four-year-old son and two-year-old daughter. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined they'd end up just feet from my own house. I can't believe this. I choked out. So what happened to those kids? Did they find them too? I was trying my best to keep my voice low because the twins were still sleeping in their car seats just a few feet away. But I was on the verge of hysterics. They haven't found the children yet, just some clothing and a few personal belongings. But he supposedly did leave a note confessing to abducting and killing them. According to Savannah, the police had been patrolling our street for the last week. She thinks they must have been suspicious of him, and he probably realized that and decided it would be easier just to take his own life than to take responsibility for what he did. Without even realizing it, I'd started pacing the room, muttering to myself, "How could we not have known this was going on right under our noses? Those poor little babies, their poor family. What kind of monster could do something like this?" The sound of Hadley fussing broke through my thoughts. I had almost forgotten they were there, and I also remembered how sore I was. So I quickly sat back down and told Bryce we had to somehow put it aside and focus on being new parents. After the babies were fed and changed, 
My mom came over to visit and help us get settled in. I turned on the news, and sure enough, there was the live story from across the street. My mom and I sat in stunned silence as they retold every horrific detail. I live here on Camden Street, where this one quiet neighborhood has been rocked by what first appeared to be a suicide and has now turned into a murder investigation. 43-year-old Kenton Phillips, or Kent, as he was known to friends and neighbors, was reported missing by a friend who was unable to reach him for several days. When authorities showed up to his house, they found Phillips' body in the basement. The death was quickly ruled a suicide by self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Upon further search of the residence, police also found several bags of illegal narcotics. They haven't released an official statement on the drugs. However, they believe Kent Phillips was buying and selling drugs as part of a large local drug ring. But the most disturbing thing police found was a box containing small clothing and other children's items, such as a stuffed animal and pink pacifier. Also in the box was a newspaper article about two local missing children. After thorough investigation, it was confirmed that these items did, in fact, belong to the missing children from the article. Four-year-old Keegan Hollis and his two-year-old sister, Arden, were taken from their backyard while playing last month. Their mother, Bree Hollis, who had gone into her house to answer the phone at the time of their disappearance, appeared on our news program the following day issuing a $10,000 reward for information on her children's whereabouts. Neighbors described Kent Phillips as a quiet but polite man who kept to himself and enjoyed riding his motorcycles. In fact, we spoke to one of those neighbors earlier today. The next thing I knew, there was Savannah on the TV screen. I've known Kent since he moved in next door about five years ago, she was saying. We spoke almost daily. He wasn't married and never mentioned family. And I had only seen a handful of friends come and go the whole time I've known him. He was what you would call a loner, but I never saw any kind of suspicious behavior from him, and I would never have thought him capable of doing something like this. My thoughts and prayers go out to those children and their family. I just wish I would have known sooner and could have done something. And with that, they went back to the live reporter. But I turned off the TV. I had had enough for one day. My mom turned to me, pale and wide-eyed. I can't believe something like this could happen so close to your home, Quinn, she said. I am just so thankful that at least we know what kind of person he was, and he's gone now, so at least you won't have to worry about Hadley and Hayden's safety. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks and literally knocked the wind out of me. Tess's message, she had said she felt that my neighborhood may not be safe. It didn't make sense to me at the time. But now it made perfect sense. I can't believe I didn't recall this sooner. I think it must have struck my mom at the same time, because just as I turned to say something to her, she said, could this have been what Tessa meant? Now it makes sense. Hearing this, Bryce just rolled his eyes and took Hayden to the nursery for a diaper change. Clearly, he still was not impressed by Tessa's gifts. That night, Bryce and I slept out on the couch next to the twins in their pack and play. Our bedroom was small, and it was too difficult for me to get in and out of our bed. We took turns getting up when they would wake. I fed them, and then Bryce would change them. The longest stretch they slept at the same time was from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. It was nice to get a decent amount of sleep for the first time since they were born. I had even started to dream. In my dream, we were playing out in the backyard with the kids. They were toddlers maybe two or three. It was a sunny day, and I was blowing bubbles with Hadley while Bryce and Hayden drew on the cement patio with chalk. We were all laughing and having a great time, that is, until I noticed someone standing in the shadows at the back of the yard. I watched in absolute horror as Kent stepped out into the light and walked towards us. He stopped right in front of us and looked from Hadley to Hayden. Then looking me right in the eyes, he said, 
Those are beautiful kids you've got there. My eyes flew open, and I sat up quickly. Causing me to cringe in pain, I was drenched in sweat. I must have startled Bryce awake, because he also sat up quickly, and looked at me. Babe, what's wrong? Is it the babies? Do you need me to do something? I shook my head, still trying to shake off the awful nightmare. It had seemed so real. I could still hear Kent's voice echoing in my head. Pull it together. Quinn, it was just a dream. I told myself as I got up quietly to go to the bathroom and take my pain meds when I came back. The babies were starting to wake. For once, I was actually relieved because I don't think I could have gone back to sleep after that anyway. The days following were rough to say the least. Bryce and I were both exhausted. Maintaining any sort of scheduled day-to-day -day was next to impossible. The babies rarely slept at the same time. But luckily, what little sleep I did get didn't involve dreams of dead. Homicidal neighbors, we were still having family and friends visit us daily, so we had no need to leave the house, which was fine with me. I was more than happy to avoid the media frenzy across the street anyway, by this point. Everyone we knew had heard about what had happened. They would make comments about what a shock it was, but for the most part, everyone avoided in-depth conversation or questions about it, which I greatly appreciated. The less I had to think about it, the better. Bryce was able to take off a full two weeks for paternity leave, which was great. But it went by way too fast, and I dreaded him going back to work and me being home alone with two babies. The day before he returned to work, he got a call from his manager asking if he could come in early the next day, before his shift to discuss some changes that had been made in the department, and he didn't want to do it over the phone, we just hoped it wasn't bad news. That night, I decided to try and finally sleep in my own bed again. My pain had lessened quite a bit, and I was able to get in and out of the bed without much trouble. We moved the pack and play to the foot of our bed and set up the supplies we would need for the night. Hadley fell asleep around 9.30 p.m., and Bryce took her to our room to lay her down so he could also try and get some sleep for work the next day. I stayed out in the family room with Hayden until he finally fell asleep around 11 p.m. I quietly laid him down next to his sister and crawled into bed. I think I was asleep before my head even hit the pillow. I was awakened a short time later by a bright light in my eyes. When my eyes adjusted, I realized it was our video monitor we had set up before the twins arrived. We had plugged it in on the shelf in our headboard, and I guess we had forgotten to turn it off. What could have set it off or maybe it was the furnace coming on? And had it been going off every night, and we just didn't realize it? I stared at the night vision view of the empty cribs in the nursery, for a second. I could have sworn I saw one of the stars on Hadley's mobile moving, but I knew it was just my tired eyes playing tricks on me. I reached up to turn it off, when it suddenly shut off by itself. It must have been in power save mode. I heard the baby starting to stir. I sighed and carefully got out of bed changed them both, then fed them before they fell asleep again. I swaddled them and laid them back in their pack and play and tried to lay back down again. But as soon as I did, that same bright light from the monitor was shining in my eyes again. I knew it wasn't the furnace this time, so I picked it up and panned the room. Everything seemed to be in its place. The bookshelf under the window, the drawers next to the closet. But then, my eye caught sight of something in the floor. I zoomed in to see a face-down picture frame that was given to me at my shower. Bryce's mom brought some pictures by that she had gotten developed from the hospital the day the twins were born. I had just put a picture of the four of us in that frame today and placed it on top of the bookshelf. It must have fallen and set off the monitor. Mystery solved. I reached up and turned off the monitor and drifted back to sleep at least for a few hours. When the kids and I got up the next morning, Bryce had already left for work. 
I remembered his boss wanted to talk to him and immediately got a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I took Hadley and Hayden to their room to get them changed into cute little outfits. I picked the picture frame carefully off the floor and set it back on top of the bookshelf. Luckily, it hadn't broken. I peeked out the window above the bookshelf to see what the weather was like. It was a dreary day, but it was quieter on our street than it had been since we came home. There were no news crews or cop cars. There was still police tape around Ken's house. But I was starting to feel like maybe we were finally going to have some peace and be able to put this whole ordeal behind us. I really wish I had been right. I had just put the twins in their bouncy seats in the living room when my cell phone rang. I saw that it was Bryce calling from work, and I prayed he wasn't calling with bad news. Hey, honey, what's up? I said when I picked up. Hey, he replied. So I talked to my manager, and you'll never guess what he had to say. I couldn't tell by his voice if it was good or bad, but I was in no mood for guessing games either. So I got the obvious question out of the way. You didn't get fired, did you? I asked. Not even close, he answered. In fact, it's the complete opposite. My manager called me in to tell me he has accepted a higher-paying position at another hospital, and he is recommending me for his replacement. That was definitely not the news I was expecting, but I was thrilled. Bryce, that's amazing! I gushed. Well, don't get too excited just yet. He told me, "I have to submit my resume to the board and interview for the position still, but Roger thinks I will be a shoe in for the job now. You realize this would mean more hours and seeing more patients, but it would also mean a large pay increase, and we wouldn't have to worry about you looking for work or us struggling financially, even though he was trying to disguise it. I could hear the excitement in his voice. Wow, honey." I'm so excited for you, and for us, we'll talk more about it when you get home. Love you was what I said to him as we hung up. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, Tessa, you were right again. About a week later, things were really starting to fall into place. Bryce was offered the manager position, and after a bit of training, he was set to start the week after Thanksgiving. The babies were finally getting into a routine, and I was starting to get some sleep at night. The nightmares had stayed away, and the neighborhood had remained fairly quiet. One night, we had just finished watching Survivor when the local news came on. The first headline story caption under the news anchor read: "Suicide note from the Camden Street murderer goes public." We begin our evening with breaking news. Police have released the suicide note written by Kent Phillips, who is being dubbed the Camden Street Killer. Phillips was found dead in his home November 4th by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Also found in the home were items belonging to two local missing children. In the note, Phillips confesses to abducting and killing the two children. There has yet to be any leads or clues as to the victims' whereabouts. We warn you that parts of this note may be disturbing to younger viewers," said the anchor man. Then they showed a clip of the local sheriff at a press conference in front of City Hall early that day. I listened in shock as he read from the suicide note. To whoever finds this, if you're reading this, it means I'm finally free, free from the guilt of what I've done. Free from the darkness that has controlled me for so long and made me do terrible things. To the parents of these two young children, I am so sorry for what I have taken from you. I never intended for this to happen. When I passed them out playing that day, something came over me. I had only wanted to take them and raise them as my own, but once I had them, darkness would not let me keep them. He wanted them for himself. I knew the only way to save them was to end their lives, as I must do now to save myself from the evil that has plagued my life for too long. I just hope eventually my friends and family can forgive what I've done. Good riddance to this cruel existence, and may God have mercy on whatever's left of my soul. 
Kenton L. Phillips. The sheriff paused and removed his reading glasses before addressing the crowd again. Mr. Phillips' body was found in the basement of his home on Camden Street November 4th. Next to his body, we found a painted symbol commonly used in satanic rituals. We believe Mr. Phillips was participating in practices of the occult, and this may be what he refers to as darkness. Although he has admitted to murder, he did not leave any clues as to the whereabouts of the victims. We will be conducting a more thorough investigation of Mr. Phillips' property in hopes of finding some answers. If you or someone you know has any information on this case, please call the Sheraton County Police Department or your local Crime Stoppers Division. Mrs. Hollis, the mother of the missing children, is now offering the $10,000 reward for any information that leads to the location of her children. You can remain anonymous. Thanks for your time. And that was that. Hearing the confession made me physically sick to my stomach thinking what he had done to those poor children. And I also knew that the peacefulness in the neighborhood was going to be short-lived any moment now. Authorities would be back out here, probably demolishing Ken's property, in hopes of finding something. Anything. Sure enough, within 24 hours, they had all taken their places again across the street. This time they had brought with them construction vehicles and a dump truck. And of course, Channel 7 News was there again, afraid to miss one second of the action. I rolled my eyes as I walked away from the bay window. I would have to find a way to drown out the commotion because I had more important things to focus on. Mainly, the fact that Thanksgiving was in three days, and for some stupid reason. I had volunteered our house for dinner this year. When I agreed to do it, I was thinking it was a great idea because it meant we wouldn't have to haul the kids around all day. Bryce's mom and my mom agreed to help clean the house and cook the food. It was just going to be immediate family, our parents, siblings, and grandparents. But now that it was right around the corner, I was starting to panic thinking about what all needed done beforehand. While Hadley and Hayden napped in their cribs, I started tidying up and made phone calls to find out what dishes people were bringing. My mom said she'd come over Wednesday night to help me finish cleaning, and she'd be there early Thursday to help start the cooking. I was starting to feel a little more at ease about it, so I decided I'd relax and put my feet up for a bit. Of course, the twins had a different idea. I fed and changed them and was turning to leave their room when something on top of the bookshelf caught my eye. It was the picture frame again, and even though it hadn't fallen off this time, it had somehow turned face down on top of the bookcase. I picked it up and placed it back upright. I must not have set it completely upright the last time. So I made sure it seemed secure before I left the room this time. Bryce had to work late, so it was around 7 p.m. and already dark out when he got home. He said his day went well, but he was exhausted. He stayed up for a bit and watched TV with me. When Hadley fell asleep at 8.30, Bryce put her in her crib and headed to bed himself. Hayden was asleep about a half hour later, so I laid him down and turned in for the night as well. Sometime later, I heard the crying start. I rubbed my eyes and rolled out of bed, still half asleep. When I reached the nursery door just across the hall, I saw that it was shut. This was strange, because we made sure to leave it cracked a little, even stranger. Was that when I tried to open it? I realized it was also locked. No matter how hard I tried twisting the knob, the door wouldn't budge. Their crying became shriller, more frantic. It was almost as if something or someone were hurting or scaring them. I started to panic and began pushing on the door with all my weight. The crying just got louder and louder. I screamed for Bryce and right as he reached me, the door flew open and I was blinded by the super bright light illuminating from the room. My eyes flew open as I sat up in my bed, gasping for breath. I was immediately aware of two things, one being that it was all just another horrible dream. And the second was that the blinding light, 
I had seen in my dream was actually from the monitor coming on again. From what I could see, neither baby was actually awake or crying yet. But I did hear a faint sound coming from the monitor. I picked up it up for a closer look. This time, I knew my eyes couldn't have been playing tricks on me. The mobile above Hadley's crib was turning. I knew I hadn't turned it on. And she certainly couldn't have touched it. I could hear the soft tune of Rockabye Baby playing as it spun. Then, it stopped suddenly. I closed my eyes tight for a second, and hoped this was just another dream. Even though I knew it wasn't, with the monitor still in my hand, I threw off my blanket and started to climb out of bed, just as the music started up again. This time, it was the mobile above Hayden's crib. I watched in disbelief as the mobile began to pick up speed. The plush stars were swinging faster and faster. I raced down the hall to the nursery and flung open the door dot dot dot, but it had stopped. No mysterious moving mobiles. No lullaby music. Nothing but complete silence. I walked over and looked from one crib to the other. Both babies were sleeping on their left sides. They looked so peaceful and innocent that for a moment, I almost forgot why I had rushed in there in the first place. But the vision from my nightmare and the sound of the moving mobiles were still fresh in my mind. A chill ran down my spine and I shivered. Had the room been this cold a moment ago? I started to leave the room to check the thermostat in the hall when I heard one of the babies start to fuss. After I fed, changed, and got them both back to sleep, I spent the rest of the night sitting in the rocking chair in their room and trying to wrap my head around what had just taken place. When I heard Bryce get up the next morning, I snuck out to tell him about my dream and seeing the mobiles moving. He said that it just sounded like I need more sleep. Thank you. Captain Obvious, and he thought the nightmare could be because of the events surrounding Kent's death and me being a new mom and wanting to protect my kids. I didn't want to admit it, but that made sense. It still didn't explain the mobiles, though. Is it possible that I imagined it? Either way, I really just wanted to try and somehow put it behind me, at least for the time being. I went about my day as usual, taking care of the babies and trying to get some things done around the house in the few quiet moments I got between feedings, changings, etc. Occasionally, I would hear the ruckus outside on the street. I peeked out the bay window at one point and saw a large bobcat digging in Kent's backyard. Besides the workers and news crews, there were quite a few other bystanders watching. They were whispering and pointing, but I couldn't see that there was anything worth getting excited about. So I went back to finishing up the laundry before the twins got up for another feeding. At a little after 5 p.m., I got a call from one of my best friends from school, Nora. She sounded frantic. Oh, my gosh, Quinn, turn on Channel 7 News quick. I fumbled for the remote on the coffee table and clicked it on. Once again, the familiar view of our neighborhood appeared behind the live-action news anchor, Karina Fuentes, who had been camped out in front of Ken's house practically since this whole mess began. Nora and I sat in silence and listened. Only moments ago, construction crews uncovered what appears to be human remains in the backyard of Kenton Phillips' property. I spoke with the police chief earlier today who told me they had received an anonymous tip from a neighbor who had seen Phillips hauling large landscaping items the day after the Hollis children's disappearance. This provoked police to focus specifically on the newly landscaped area in the back corner of the yard behind Phillips' home. Although we do not have confirmation on the identities of the remains found, I've been told the police are confident that they belong to the missing children. A forensic lab is analyzing the remains as we speak, and I will bring you an update as soon as we hear anything else. I had almost forgotten I was holding the phone up to my ear until I heard Nora speak again. Can you believe that? They were buried in his backyard this whole time? Seriously, how sick can a person be to do something like that? I mean, I can't imagine what those kids' parents must be going through, you know? 
But I guess at least now they'll have some sort of closure and be able to say goodbye with a proper burial. She was rambling on so quickly that I could barely get a word in. This was fine with me, though, because it gave me a chance to swallow the lump that had risen in my throat. I don't know if it was the postpartum hormones or just the fact that I was now a mom of two babies myself, but for a minute, I did try and put myself in Brie Hollis' shoes. The grief I would feel if anything like this happened to my kids was more than I could bear to think about. I felt like I could be sick. Quinn, are you still there? I heard Nora ask. I blinked several times and swallowed hard. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Ah, uh, sorry. It's just so unimaginable that something like this could happen in such a quiet neighborhood as this, but maybe now that it's all over, we can finally return to normal around here. Nora chuckled saying, if I were you, I'd move to another neighborhood. I chuckled too, but in the back of my mind I wondered if she didn't have a good point there. Would it be better if we just picked up and started over somewhere else? I shook my head at the thought. Even if I wanted to, there's no way we could uproot the twins or even be able to sell our house in this market, especially not on this street right now. I hung up with Nora and laid a mat out for tummy time with the twins while we waited for Bryce to get home from work. He had already heard the latest news from a co-worker. He said he was just relieved that the mystery was solved, and he, too, was looking forward to some normalcy again. The babies had taken late naps, so I stayed up with them after Bryce went to bed around 9.30. I was catching up on some episodes of The Ellen Show that we had recorded while bouncing the twins in their bouncy seats around 10 p.m. Hayden had just fallen asleep when I heard a loud crash sound come from down the hall where the bedrooms were. I picked up Hadley so she wouldn't wake her brother and headed in the direction of the noise. I passed the nursery and went to our bedroom, thinking maybe Bryce's phone fell off the knit stand where he charges it. But when I flicked on the light, Bryce was fast asleep and the phone was still on the knit stand. I shrug and started to head back down the hall towards the family room. As I passed the nursery again, I noticed that this time the door was standing wide open. I was fairly positive it was nearly closed when I had walked by just a minute ago. I took a step inside to turn the light on and stepped down on something hard. I felt along the wall with my free hand for the light switch and flicked it on. I looked down and under my foot was that same face down picture frame. I could not believe my eyes. How was it possible that I had picked this thing up twice already and this time? Not only did it fall off the bookshelf, but it had somehow landed all the way across the room. I bent down to pick it up and noticed this time the glass had completely shattered. I didn't hear anything break when I stepped on it, so maybe that explained the loud noise I had heard a few minutes ago. But that didn't explain how it ended up where it did, it just wasn't adding up. A chill ran up my back again, and I realized the room was absolutely freezing cold. The thermostat seemed to be working just fine, so I made a mental note to have Bryce check the vents in the house tomorrow. In the midst of this momentary chaos, Hadley had somehow fallen asleep in my arms. So before I left the room, I laid her down carefully in her crib then took the broken frame to the kitchen and threw it away after removing the picture from it. I was still puzzled by what happened, but I was too tired to try to make sense of it tonight. I took Hayden to his crib and crawled into bed. Before I could even finish my nightly silent prayers, I had started to dream. Thankfully, this dream had nothing to do with the babies or the nursery this time. I was in a strange house. I didn't recognize it, yet there was something oddly familiar about it. It was very cluttered and disorganized. There was a musty smell like smoke throughout the house. Where was I? I couldn't see or hear anyone else in the house, but I did hear a faint sound of running water, so I started checking out the rest of the house. Opposite the family room I was in was the kitchen. Just off to one side of the kitchen was a hallway. Down the hallway, I came to a bathroom. 
It had white and blue checkered tile on the walls, and there was an oval-shaped white antique tub with a navy bath mat in front of it on the floor. I had thought I'd heard water coming from here, but there was no running water that I could see. There was, however, a very creepy vibe in this room. I continued down the hallway. There were two bedrooms past the bathroom. One on the right, one on the left. The first one on the left had nothing but stack boxes everywhere. It was disheveled and reeked of smoke. The last bedroom on the right must have been the master bedroom. It had black walls with red shag carpet. There was a queen-sized bed in the middle of the room that was unmade and messy. And across from the bed on a dresser was a TV. I saw no items that would help identify who the homeowner was. No pictures, no personal belongings with a name on them. The closet did have only male clothing in it, but none that I recognized. But that still didn't explain where I was or why I was here. I turned to leave, and out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a little black book on the edge of the dresser beside the TV. I picked it up to see what it was. The title was in another language, Latin, maybe. And below, that was a sign of a star within a circle. I knew I had seen this symbol somewhere before, but I couldn't place where. I quickly put the book back and headed down the hall. I had an uneasy feeling that just got stronger the longer I was there, so I wanted to get the heck out now. Just as I reached for the doorknob on the front door, I heard a soft voice, just slightly above a whisper, say, "Don't go." Not yet. Even though it frightened me, I couldn't help but turn around to see where it was coming from. I saw no one, but I heard the voice again. This time it sounded further away. This way, it beckoned to me. Everything inside of me screamed, "Run the other way, get out of here!" But for some reason, I felt compelled to obey. I followed the sound of the voice to a door off the other side of the kitchen. Down here, the voice whispered again, leading me down a flight of cement steps. I had no idea where I was going, but I couldn't seem to stop myself either. I felt like I was no longer in control of myself when I got to the bottom of the stairs. I was standing in a large, unfinished basement. It was cold and dimly lit, and there was an old, musty smell all around. I heard a sound and took another step into the room. As my eyes adjusted, I saw a man on his knees in the middle of the room. He was wearing an old white shirt. And tattered jeans. His hair was a salt and pepper color. I realized he was rocking back and forth and muttering something that I couldn't understand under his breath. On the concrete floor, underneath where he was kneeling, was what looked like a red circle that had been spray painted there. His head was down, and he was holding something in his hands that I couldn't see. He didn't seem to be aware that I was there. I nearly jumped out of my skin when a deep voice, like a growl, bellowed from somewhere in the shadows. Tell me again what happened that night. I panned the darkness of the room, hoping to find where the voice was coming from, but saw no one else in the room. As the man kneeling in the floor responded, a cold chill ran through my body. I saw them out that day playing by themselves. I brought them here just as you told me to do. They wouldn't stop crying, so I knew that I had to make them be quiet. I drove them around until it was dark, and they had cried themselves to sleep. Then I pulled the car into the garage and shut the garage door. I left the car running with them inside it and went into the house. I thought about going to get them several times, but decided to let them suffer, to let them die. When I came out an hour later to turn the car off. They were unconscious but still alive. I brought them into the house and wrapped them in towels on the bathroom floor. Then I filled the tub with scalding hot water, just like you said to do, and one at a time. Starting with the boy, I laid them in the scalding water and held them down until I was sure the life had left them. Very good. So now you know what you must do next," growled the deep voice to the man. He immediately became still and sat straight up, looking directly ahead toward the sound of the voice. 
I took another step into the room and looked in the same direction, but still couldn't see who was speaking. However, now that I had a better view of what was unfolding in front of me, I finally realized where I was and who this man was in front of me dot 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 and why his voice had sounded so familiar, somehow. I was staring right at Kent Phillips, I covered my mouth to stifle a scream. I wanted to run, but my feet seemed glued to the cement. Unable to move, and as he responded, yes, I know what I must do. I got a clear view of what he had been holding in his hands. I gasped in complete terror as I saw a picture of Hadley and Hayden from the hospital the day they were born. To add to my horror, he turned to look my direction, and his eyes were black as coal, and he was bleeding from a wound in the side of his head. No, I heard myself scream repeatedly as my feet finally unglued themselves from the floor. I ran as fast as I could up the stairs and to the front door. I opened the door, and sure enough, I was staring at my own house from across the street. Quinn, I heard the voice growl my name from inside the house. Without hesitation, I sped across the street as fast as my feet would move. But the voice seemed to follow me, beckoning me with every step. Getting closer and closer, Quinn dot 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 Quinn. Quinn, I opened my eyes and realized Bryce was hovering over me in our bed. Pale and staring wide-eyed at me, jeez, Quinn. You were screaming in your sleep, you scared the hell out of me. I sat up quickly and looked around. Breathing heavily and shaking from head to toe, I muttered yeah, join the club. This was the creepiest, most realistic nightmare yet, where did that even come from? I glanced at the clock, it was only a little after midnight. My mouth was really dry, so I got up to get a drink and go to the bathroom before trying to sleep again. It felt like I hadn't slept at all, yet all I could do was lie awake and stare at the ceiling, replaying every detail of my nightmare. Why did I have to dream about him again, or that creepy house? How could I have imagined all those specific details when I've never even set foot inside of Kent's house? My imagination must be more active than I thought, because there was no way I could have really seen those things. I tried to rationalize with myself that I must have just spent so much time imagining the details of what happened and that had to have led to this disturbing dream, but it had seemed so real. I could have sworn I was actually there. I could smell the smoke. I felt the black leather book in my hands with the familiar symbol on it. I heard the water running, and that voice, what was that? I shivered as I recalled how I had been so powerless to its beckoning. Was this all just a manifestation from what I'd seen from the news stories? Or was there even the slightest possibility that I was seeing and feeling everything that Kent did just before he took those kids and killed them then himself? But this wasn't about that oh are those kids, this was about my babies. Almost as if they could sense, I was thinking about them. I heard the monitor switch on, and the baby started to cry. My head was still swimming as I gradually rolled out of bed, and went into their nursery. They were both back asleep fairly quickly, after a change and short feeding. I wish the same could be said for myself. Even though I didn't have any more dreams that night, once I finally fell asleep, I tossed and turned until morning, when I got up at seven with the twins. I was more tired than when I went to bed. There was still a lot to get done with Thanksgiving, just a day away. The final head count for dinner guests was 15, counting me, Bryce, and the kids. I had straightened up most of the main rooms that would be seen, but I still needed to dust vacuum, and clean toilets and counters between all of our family. The food was pretty much covered. My mom had already picked up the turkey, and I wanted to make my famous pumpkin cream pie, but I needed to get the ingredients. People had been so generous by bringing us meals and other necessities that we really hadn't needed to make a trip to the grocery yet. There was no way I was ready to try and tackle shopping by myself with the kids in tow. So my mom graciously agreed to come watch them for me while I went. 
I have to admit, I was more than a little excited to have some alone time and get out of the house for a little bit. I took full advantage of my time out without the kids and walked slowly up and down each aisle. I picked up all the ingredients I needed for my dessert, plus diapers and other must-haves for the house. I browsed the makeup section and even meandered through the seasonal aisle to see what Christmas things they were starting to put out. Finally, I headed to the front to check out. I scanned the gossip magazine racks on my way to the open lane. Almost every one of them had something about the Camden Street killer on them. I shouldn't have been surprised. It was, after all, the talk of the town, and even the country for that matter. One particular cover caught my eye, it had a picture of the abducted children, and the headline read details and photographs from inside Kent Phillips' home. My heart nearly dropped into my feet as I recalled my dream from the previous night, with my curiosity piqued. I grabbed the magazine and tossed it into the cart. When I got home, my mom helped me unload and put away the groceries. Not only that, but she had also taken care of the dusting, vacuuming, and other minor things I had left to do on my list. This was such a huge relief because the trip to the grocery had worn me out more than I had expected it to, so I wasn't sure how I was going to get everything done. After my mom left, I could tell the twins were getting tired. I fed and then rocked them for about 30 minutes until they were asleep and put them in their bouncy seats. I decided this was the perfect time to look at the magazine I picked up from the store. I flipped through it, page by page, until I came to the article in the center of the magazine. My mouth literally fell open, and my stomach was instantly in knots when I saw the pictures included with the article headline, where Keegan and Arden Hollis spent their tragic final hours. The first two pictures under the headline were rooms in Kent's house. The truly scary thing was that I had seen these rooms before. In fact, I could have taken these pictures myself in my dream the night before. The one on the left was of the bathroom, where I thought I had heard the water coming from. It had the same blue and white checkered tiles with the same blue bath mat in front of the same antique, oval-shaped tub. The caption read to towels were found wrapped around the children's bodies and it is believed they may have taken their last breaths in this very bathtub. I hadn't even realized I'd started crying until I saw the tears fall onto page I was reading. I wiped my eyes with my sleeve and moved on to the next photo. This one was of the suicide note found next to Kent's body, below his signature, was a symbol, the same symbol that I saw in the black book in Kent's bedroom in my dream. But what did it mean? I wasn't really reading the article, but certain phrases were highlighted like items found suggest Phillips was a Satanist and claimed to be hearing voices that were controlling his actions. I flipped to the next page of the article, and the picture on that page nearly knocked the breath right out of me. I recognized it right away. Dimly lit room. Cement floors. And right in the middle of the basement that I saw through my own eyes in my dream was the large, red, spray-painted symbol. Now it was finally starting to come together for me. This symbol that I had seen repeatedly on the basement floor, the black book, and now the suicide note, had to be the sign of devil worship I had heard the reporters talk about. My next thought sent chills up my spine. Was it possible, even remotely, that the creepy deep voice I had heard could have actually been the darkness that Kent described in his own suicide note? I wasn't even sure I believed in the devil or in occults, but I now knew what I felt and saw was real. Hadley made a noise and it startled me so much that my body jerked and I dropped the magazine onto the coffee table. And, of course, that scared both of them awake. I took them to the nursery and changed their diapers and then put them in pajamas for the night, thankfully. Bryce came home just as I was bringing them back out to the family room. He took Hayden from my arms. I must have still looked as shaken up as I felt because he asked if I was feeling okay. I really didn't know what to tell him, so I managed a smile and said, UH. Yeah, fine. I hadn't told him about my dream because, 
At the time, I thought it was just another crazy nightmare. I didn't even know where to start now that I'd read the article. I was afraid he'd think I was mental and want me to seek professional help. So I decided not to say anything for the time being. Besides, I still had a lot to do to get ready for Thanksgiving tomorrow. I was very appreciative that Bryce kept the twins occupied while I prepared the food ingredients for the following day. I wanted to get as much done as I could before the morning. My mom was coming over around 6 a.m. to start cooking the turkey and get the other dishes ready. When that was done, I fed the babies and then took one last sweep through the house to make sure it was presentable for guests before getting ready for bed around 10 p.m. Hadley was already in her crib. And Bryce was laying Hayden down as I came out of our room from changing into my pajamas. He and I sat down together on the couch and collectively sighed from the stress of the day. Bryce reached down for something under the coffee table and came up with the magazine I had been reading earlier. He gave me a look and rolled his eyes. Really, honey? Because we obviously didn't get enough of the story from living right across the street. I knew this was the reaction he would have. So I decided it best not to push the issue by mentioning my dream. We spent about 10 more minutes on the couch before turning in for the night. I lay awake in bed for a good half hour, going over the details of tomorrow's big family affair, before finally drifting off. In my dream this time, our whole family was sitting around the table for Thanksgiving dinner. We were laughing and making small talk, passing around the plates and plates of food. Bryce and I were sitting at the end and across from us were his parents and sister. My mom was beside us and next to her were my brothers and then my dad at the other end. Next to Bryce's parents sat his grandparents. Claudia, his paternal grandmother, who never remarried after Neil's father left when he was a little boy, and his mother's father. Garrett, who lost his wife to cancer a few months after Bryce was born. My mom's mom. Blythe, sat at the end of the table to my left. And my dad's mom, Lana, or Nana Lana, as she was affectionately known, sat at the other end of the table to my right. The only two people missing were Hadley and Hayden. Just in front of me on the table, sat the baby monitor. So, clearly, the babies must have been in their crib sleeping. I flicked on the monitor just to check on the twins. But when the room came into view, I realized the cribs were empty. I jumped up from the table in a panic, but no one seemed to notice. In fact, no one even looked my direction as I ran out of the room and down the hall to the nursery. I burst through the door and up to the cribs. Empty. They were empty. I began frantically searching the room for any sign of the babies. My heart was pounding out of my chest and I felt like I was going to throw up. Just when I think it can't get worse, I noticed something on the wall to my left. My knees gave out as I stared up at the red symbol of a star within a circle that I had seen too many times recently. And what was it painted with? I forced myself to stand up and take a closer look. I reached out to touch it and quickly pulled my hand back. It was wet and covered in blood. I hit the floor again as a blood-curdling scream escaped my throat. I rocked back and forth begging myself to wake up, wake up, wake up. Finally, I awoke in a cold sweat and sat straight up in our bed. Trying to catch my breath, I was really starting to think I was losing my mind. I looked at the clock and it was nearly 3 a.m. I was actually surprised the babies hadn't woken me up yet. Not that I was complaining. I turned on the monitor just to check in, and for some reason, the room didn't come into view right away like usual. It actually almost looked like there was a gray mist or haze covering the camera. It slowly faded and finally the room came into view. It seemed strange, but I shrugged it off as watched Hayden and Hadley sleeping peacefully in their cribs. I played with the camera functions for a few minutes, turning up the volume and listening. Panning the room, zooming in and out on the babies. All seemed to be well, 
but then suddenly the view went out again. It had that same mist-like appearance covering the lens. And then, it was gone again. My guess was that maybe the camera had become unplugged from the wall, and the battery was running low. I penned the room one last time before falling back asleep. About an hour later, I heard the monitor come back on, as the babies were waking up to be fed and changed. While I was in the nursery, I checked the camera to be sure it wasn't unplugged. It wasn't. I wiped off the lens as well just to be sure it wasn't cloudy before I headed back to bed. I had literally just closed my eyes to sleep again when I heard the monitor power on and its bright light filled the room. The noise coming from it wasn't crying babies, though it was static. Like as if someone had turned on a radio that was on an out-of-tune station. The view was fuzzy as well. I could only make out the details of the nursery every once in a while when the hay subsided. I turned the monitor off and back on to hopefully reset whatever issue was going on. When it came back on, it worked just fine. I figured there must be some kind of short in the monitor signal or something. I was not going to let my mind run wild with ideas any more than it already had. I awoke to noises coming from the kitchen, startled. I jumped out of bed and headed down the hall. I quickly peeked in on the twins as I went by their room. They were still sound asleep. So I made my way to the kitchen to find that my mother had let herself in and was preparing the turkey for the oven. Good morning, sweetie, she whispered to me, so as not to wake the babies. You look tired, didn't you sleep well last night? I just gave her a look. Didn't she remember how scarce sleep is for a new mom? And I wasn't even about to go into the night terrors I've been having. As if in reply to the look I was giving her, she said, why don't you go back to bed and catch a few more Z's? I can get things started in here until the kids get up. I was just about to give in and thank her when I heard one of the babies start crying from their room. Right on cue as usual, I sighed, smiling. After I got the twins up and fed, I dressed them in their cute little matching, baby's first Thanksgiving onesies. We had gotten Hadley the cuttest little tutu, and coordinating headband with a bow on it to go with hers. This would be the first time the great-grandparents would be meeting them, so they had to look their best. I got Bryce up around 9.30 to help me with multitasking between getting dinner ready and taking care of the kids. Five hours, to naps, to feedings, and to diaper changes later, we were just about ready for guests. We set the table, and had about a half hour of relaxing, until my dad, brothers, and grandma showed up at our front door. After hugs and greetings all around, my grandma quickly made her way to the babies in their bouncy seats and cooed over them for several minutes. We all just smiled as we watched her interacting with them. Then came another knock on the door. This time, it was my Nana, and just a few minutes after her, came Bryce's sister, parents, and his grandparents. Everyone immediately went to the babies, and were hugging and kissing on them, and telling us how cute they were. It became a little chaotic, and I didn't realize just how small our house was until that moment when we had all of our family in it. After what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only about 20 minutes, my mom came out of the kitchen and said that everything was ready to be served. I told everyone to go ahead and take their seats as I excused myself to the nursery to feed and lay the babies down. I brought the monitor out to the table so I could hear them if they needed anything. I took my place at the dinner table next to Bryce, who was at one of the ends. We all joined hands and Bryce's grandmother, Claudia, began to say grace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. We thank you for this food, this family, and especially our two new precious additions, Hadley and Hayden. Please keep them safe and help them to grow up to be shining examples of your love and to know that they are loved so much by all of us. Bless this food we are about to eat and let it nourish our bodies. In your name we pray. Amen. We were all muttering our amens in response, 
when a huge crash from down the hall made everyone gasp. Bryce and I jumped up and looked at each other. I'll go. You stay here and go ahead and start passing around the food, Bryce said to me. I'll go with him, said Claudia, who was already standing. I sat back down and looked nervously around the table, trying to smile. I started to ask who wanted bread when my voice caught in my throat. I hadn't really looked around the table yet. But now that I had, I realized everyone was sitting in the exact same seat as they had been in my nightmare from the night before. What were the odds of that happening? How was that even possible? My sudden change of expression must have caught the others off guard because my mom quietly said, Quinn, honey, what's the matter? I was trying to come up with what to say when I heard Bryce from down the hall. Help, come quick. We all rushed from the table and raced down the hall. I'm panicking remembering the rest of my dream and hoping the babies are okay. But when I got into the hall, I see Bryce kneeling down in the doorway over the nursery. He was over top of Claudia, who was slumped over in the floor. Bryce's dad knelt down on the other side of her as Bryce stood up and looked around helplessly at all of us. What happened? I choked out to him. I don't know. As soon as I opened the nursery door, she started breathing heavily. She muttered something like, No, this doesn't feel right. I don't feel right. Then she grabbed her chest and collapsed before I could even catch her. He was visibly shaken up as he recounted what had happened while in the background. His dad was shouting mom over and over again, trying unsuccessfully to get Claudia to come too. Both babies were crying at the top of their lungs, so my mom and I stepped gently into the nursery to try and soothe them. Bryce and his dad were able to move Claudia to the couch. Lucy had already called the paramedics, and they were there within 10 minutes. They immediately began CPR and rushed Claudia out on a stretcher and into the ambulance to the nearest hospital. Bryce followed it along with his parents and sister. When they left, the house was oddly quiet. No one spoke for several minutes. I guess we were still trying to process what was happening and had no idea what to say that would make any of it better. My mom joined me and the twins on the couch. Wrapping her arm around my shoulders, she was the first to finally speak. Well, there's nothing we can do now but pray and wait for someone to call. If anyone is hungry, go ahead you help yourself to the food before it gets cold and goes to waste. My brothers didn't need to be told twice. They quietly hurried into the dining room and began shoveling food onto their plates. My dad came over and laid his hand on my arm and said, Sweetie, you need to eat something too. You have to keep your strength up for those babies before heading into the dining room with my grandma. My nana stood up solemnly from the recliner and escorted Bryce's grandpa, Garrett, to the dining room. And my mom and I followed shortly with both babies in tow. I can't believe this happened, I said under my breath as I took my place again at the table. I had absolutely no appetite, but I forced myself to take a few bites anyway. We tried to make small talk, but it was obvious that everyone's mind wasn't really on the weather or current sports scores when everyone had eaten what they could. My mom and I cleared the table while my brothers took Hadley and Hayden into the living room. By around 6 p.m., everyone had left, and I was, once again, in an eerily quiet house. The events of the day were swirling through my head a million miles a minute, and I was hoping Bryce would call soon with an update. I was so distracted with my thoughts. I almost didn't hear my phone when it rang. I quickly picked it up and heard Bryce's voice on the other end. By his tone, I could tell he didn't have good news. Well, from what the doctor says, he believes it was a heart attack brought on by an ongoing condition with her heart. She still isn't conscious, but they are trying to get her stable enough for more tests and possibly surgery in the morning. Oh, honey, I am so sorry, I said. Knowing it wouldn't help, is there anything that I can do? 
Do you want the kids and me to come to the hospital? No, there's nothing any of us can do right now. I'll be home in a little bit. Love you. And then I heard the dial tone on the other end. I sank down on the couch and began sobbing and praying silently. Please Lord, be with our family right now, especially Claudia. Please heal her. We love her so very much and aren't ready to lose her. After Bryce got home and the twins were asleep, we just laid in bed and stared at each other for the longest time. I stroked his hair and face and I could tell he was holding back tears. When he finally closed his eyes, I watched him toss and turn for quite a while. I knew he wouldn't be getting much sleep tonight which would be especially rough for him, starting his new position the following day. He was already gone for work when the babies woke me up around 8.30 the next morning. I kept my phone close to me because he had told me before falling asleep that he'd call when he knew anything more about his grandma, so I tried to occupy my time with busy work. I vacuumed the dining room from the worst Thanksgiving ever yesterday. I watched a little daytime television. I checked my phone at least 10 times an hour, just in case. When I hadn't heard anything by noon, I was hoping that no news was good news at this point. I didn't want to bother him at work, so I decided to try his dad's phone and get an update from him. Before I could even dial, I heard the knob on the front door turn. Bryce burst into the room. His face was white and it was obvious that he'd been crying from how red and irritated his eyes were. Before he could even say anything, I knew, Claudia hadn't made it, oh no. I said, rushing to embrace him as he broke down in tears. I wasn't even there to say goodbye, he whispered between sobs. I held him for several minutes before he calmed down enough for me to ask what happened. He said that she had done okay through the night, but when they took her down for testing, she had another heart attack. They tried to revive her, but weren't able to this time. Both his parents had been there with her when it happened. He got the call from his mom while he was at work and knew he couldn't make it the rest of the day, so he left and headed straight home. Watching Bryce trying unsuccessfully to regain his composure, all I could do was cry with him and tell him how sorry I was. I couldn't imagine the grief his father must be feeling right now after losing his mother so suddenly. Just yesterday, she had been here with us, smiling, saying grace. If only we had known she wasn't well, maybe we could have helped her. She should have told us about her heart condition. Heart condition, heart condition, I gasped loudly, startling both Bryce and the babies in their bouncy seats. What's wrong? he said, seeing the expression on my face. I wiped the tears from my eyes and quickly replied, nothing. I'll be right back. I grabbed my phone off the coffee table and headed toward our bedroom at the end of the hall. I was shaking as I dialed my mom's work number. Hey honey, what's up? came the answer on the other end. Mom, I have some really bad news. I began. But she interrupted before I could finish. It's Claudia, isn't it? She asked. I've had a bad feeling all morning, and when I didn't hear anything from you, I feared the worst. Yes, I responded, solemnly. Her heart gave out this morning as they were trying to do more testing. Oh, Quinn, I'm so sorry. How is Bryce doing? Can I do anything? She asked. He's taking it pretty rough as expected. And no, there really isn't anything anyone can do right now. Neil and his siblings will be handling arrangements, and they'll let us know what we can help with. But, Mom, that's not the only reason I called you, I said. Oh, she said curiously. Well, what else did you need to tell me then? Well, I was sitting here asking myself why Claudia couldn't have just told us about her ongoing heart condition. And those words stuck in my head. Because we both heard them before, I trailed off. Realizing what I was getting at, I heard her gasp loudly just as I had a moment ago. Oh my god, Quinn, you're right? 
We both sat silently for a few moments, stunned by this revelation. Why hadn't I thought of this when Tessa had mentioned it? As if she could read my thoughts, my mom broke the silence saying, but neither of us could have guessed this would happen. Tessa guessed, I said solemnly. I had made a mental note to give her a call later and tell her she had been right about everything. But first, I needed to tend to my grieving husband. I hung up with my mom and went back out to sit on the couch next to Bryce, who was now holding the twins on his lap and talking baby talk to them. His eyes were still red and teary, but it was nice to see him smiling. The rest of the day went on, as normal as humanly possible. We took the kids for a walk around the block to clear our heads and get some fresh air. I warmed up Thanksgiving leftovers for dinner, but all Bryce could do was push it around on his plate. I couldn't blame him. His parents called shortly after dinner to tell him they had an appointment the following day with the funeral home to make arrangements for Claudia. They said they'd call him afterwards, and that was it. We sit and wait, again. We tried to watch some TV, but I don't think either of us even knew what was on the screen. There was a haze of grief surrounding our whole house, and it was palpable. Even the babies were fussier than normal. Luckily, they were both asleep before 9 p.m., so we picked them up and took them to the nursery. Bryce hesitated at their door, looking down at the carpet. I saw sadness wash over his face again, as I'm sure he was replaying what had happened with his grandma in this very spot, just one day before. I wasn't sure if he'd ever be able to set foot in here, without thinking about it again. I led the way to the cribs, and after we laid the babies down, we turned to leave, but both stopped in our tracks. In the chaos of what had happened yesterday, it never occurred to us to follow up on finding out what had made that awful crashing noise that had caused Bryce and his grandma to rush to the nursery in the first place. I hadn't paid any attention the night before when I'd laid them down. But now, in the light of their motion projector, we stared down at the carpet behind the nursery door. At the white shelf that had previously been nailed to the wall above the closet. It was now into pieces on the floor, on top of the shelf. Also smashed into little pieces were some glass figurines my mother had given us depicting the stages of my pregnancy. And that wasn't even the worst part, as we knelt down to sift through the rubble. We dug out the pink and blue teddy bears given to the twins by Claudia that had been sitting on either end of the shelf before it had fallen. They were dusty, but otherwise unharmed. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Bryce slump down to the floor. His legs crossed Indian style, he was staring at the pink bear in his hands and shaking his head. I could barely make out him whispering I just don't understand as he closed his eyes and hugged the bear to his chest. That night, we lay in bed staring silently at each other again until Bryce finally closed his eyes. I so wished there had been words I could say to ease his grief, but I was hurting too, and no amount of words could take it away. I closed my eyes and began my silent prayers, Dear Lord, please be with my family. Please give Bryce the comfort in his time of grief that only you can provide. Please wrap Claudia in your arms and tell her how much we love and miss her. And a I was cut off by the white noise coming from the baby monitor above my head. It was cutting in and out, almost like a radio trying to seek a station that's in tune. Every now and then, I'd hear what sounded like muffled syllables. I brought the monitor to my ear and listened closely. There were just little blips of sound in between dead air. Then, to my horror, I began to hear a sentence come through. Keep away from those babies. It sounded like a woman's voice. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as the last word came through. Demon and then there was a low growl as it faded back to white noise. I sat straight up in bed on my knees and stared down at the monitor. Where the visual of the nursery should have been. It was pitch black. I shook it and even tapped the side of it aggressively with my hand, muttering come on, you stupid thing. 
Under my breath, having no luck, I shook Bryce to wake him up. He hesitantly rolled over to face me, and with his eyes still closed, he says what is it? I think something's wrong with this monitor, were the first words that came out of my mouth. I swear I just heard voices coming from it. He opened his eyes long enough to roll them at me and sigh, probably just picking up on someone else's monitor's frequency around here. We'll look at it more in the morning. I'm really tired, Quinn. Can't this wait? I started to tell him what I'd heard, but I stopped myself because I knew how drained he was and even I didn't want to believe what I heard was true. Sure, honey, sorry to wake you, I replied. But there was no way I was rolling over to go back to sleep after that. I crept out of bed and across the hall to the nursery. I put my ear to the door and listened for a moment. I heard nothing. I debated turning the handle and going in, but I didn't want to wake the babies when they had just gone down. I knelt down in the hallway beside the door and laid my head back on the wall. I took a few deep breaths, and out of nowhere, silent tears began to flow down my cheeks. I quickly wiped my eyes and realized I was still holding the monitor. As I stood up to take it back to our bedroom, I distinctly heard whispering coming from behind the nursery door. At first, I thought it was wind whistling, but that wasn't possible. My hand reached for the doorknob, and I heard that same low growl I had heard just moments ago from the monitor. The noises stopped abruptly as soon as I flung the door open. Once my eyes adjusted to the dark, there were two major things I noticed. First, the rocking chair was moving slowly back and forth as if it had just been rocking by itself. It was slowing to a stop before my eyes. Second, the window across the room was open about halfway. I know for a fact that this was closed when we put them to bed. I didn't bother to look around for anything else. I was getting myself and the babies out of that room. Now, I flicked the light on and carefully lifted the twins onto each shoulder, first Hadley, then Hayden. They stirred and began to fuss as I hurried out of their room, not even bothering to turn the light off as I went past. I spent the rest of the night dozing on the couch with them in their bouncy seats beside me. Why are you all out here? Bryce practically screamed in a whisper. I woke up to find you out of bed, and then the light to the nursery was on but the babies were gone. Their window was open and their monitor was on the floor. I didn't know what to think. I heard Hadley squirm behind me as I answered. I didn't either after what happened last night. Giving me an even more puzzled look and not taking his eyes off me, he came around and scooped Hadley up then sat down beside me, waiting for me to elaborate. I took a deep breath and prepared to relive the whole ordeal when I heard the faint sound of my cell phone ringing from our bedroom. I hurried to get it, but didn't recognize the number calling. Hello, I answered, tentatively. Quinn, came the reply from the woman on the other line. Yes, who is this, please, I said, still puzzled and a little annoyed, all things considered. Quinn, it's Tessa, Tessa Cohen. I've been thinking about you, and I'd like to meet with you if you have time. Today, if possible, can I come to you? Before I could even think it over, I heard myself mutter, Sure. I guess. How about noon? She agreed, and then we said our goodbyes and hung up. That was when I tried to process the fact that she had just called out of the blue needing to speak with me. Her tone sounded urgent. It must have something to do with our reading together months ago. She said she had been thinking about me, but what did that mean? Quinn, Bryce's voice interrupted my thoughts. Who was that calling? He asked as I came down the hallway from our bedroom. Well, you're not going to believe it, but that was the psychic my mom, and I did a reading with a few months back, his signature eye roll in response was proof that the rest of this conversation was not going to go over well. I know you're not going to want to hear this, I continued on, but she's been right about a lot of things, well, 
everything she said, actually. For the next half hour, I tried to unsuccessfully to recount the strange things that had been happening in the house and to convey the extremely uneasy feeling it was giving me. But because it conveniently only happens when I'm around Bryce's exact words. He was uninterested in any theories I had where supernatural events were taking place. Maybe he was just being stubborn because he didn't want to think about the possibility that what I was saying made sense, but I do not believe in coincidences. I knew there was more to this than even I could wrap my head around. But I also knew whatever the reason, it frightened me to find out. Bryce left the house around 10.30 a.m. to meet his parents at his grandma's house to start to go through her belongings in preparation for the services. I had called my mom right after my talk with Bryce to tell her about Tessa calling me. She agreed to come over and be with me when Tessa came. At least she seemed to grasp the severity of the situation. I think I paced the entire house between 11.45 until a few minutes after 12 p.m. when I saw Tessa's blue SUV pull into our driveway. I saw her get out of the car and take a long pause as she gazed in the direction of Kent's house. Then she turned her gaze back toward our house, closed her eyes, mouthed something I couldn't make out, and headed to our doorstep. I took a deep breath as I opened the door to let her in. She nodded and gave me a half-smile through pursed lips as she stepped inside. I didn't quite know what to expect, but I could tell she had a lot to say. Before she said anything, I spoke up and said, I should have called you sooner. Everything you said has been completely right. I had a feeling, she replied in a hushed but serious tone. I've been having visions, she continued. I saw on the news about your neighbor and the missing children. Although the mystery is solved and appears to be over, I still sense danger surrounding this street, particularly this house. I nodded. I had seen and felt it firsthand. Have you also been having visions, Quinn? She asked me. She seemed to be studying my reactions. I... I guess, I've been having nightmares. Seeing things that I don't understand, that seem to have to do with what happened across the street. I don't quite know what to make of it, though. I looked to my mom for reassurance. She was on the couch. Flipping through the magazine with photos from Kent's house. She shot me a puzzled look. I hadn't told her about the nightmares. Those were warnings. I think you understand more than you think you do. And I think your spiritual guides have been showing you just what you're dealing with here. She trailed off as she wandered around the living room and eventually towards the hallway. Have you been experiencing strange occurrences with any electrical devices here as well? The monitor, I exclaimed. Several times it has turned on and off by itself. I really thought either it had some sort of malfunction or that I was starting to go crazy. I hurried to the bedroom to retrieve it from its docking station and brought it out to hand it to her. She hesitated before taking it from me. There is so much mixed energy here. This monitor has been a channel through which good and bad energy has been trying to reach you. Me, I shrieked. Why me? I thought my heart was going to burst out of my chest. It was beating so hard. Because the spirits know you are perceptive. She responded as she studied the monitor screen. The image of the twins in their cribs came into view on the tiny screen. Hum, I heard her mutter as she stared intently at the monitor and headed toward the nursery. I followed close behind her. She paused in the doorway for a moment, looking toward the floor then turning to me. I'm so very sorry for your family's loss. I do not enjoy being right about situations where losing a loved one is involved. Thank you. I should have listened to you and thought of Claudia right away. None of us knew she was even sick. She was here with us for Thanksgiving and then gone the very next day. I could feel the tears start to well up in my eyes. I wouldn't necessarily say she's gone, she said in an evasive tone. In fact, I don't think her spirit has left this room since she passed. 
Have you felt like she was trying to connect with you? I thought for a second, then gasped. That was her I heard on the monitor. I heard a woman's voice saying to stay away from the babies. I was practically hyperventilating by this point. I can feel a thickness in the air. Like something dark is surrounding this whole room. Do you feel it, Quinn? I did, and I also had just noticed my mother standing in the doorway behind us. I could tell from the look on her face that she could sense it too. It's been noticeably colder in here for a while now too, I told her. She nodded in acknowledgement as she continued to scan the room, as if looking for something. I peered over the cribs at the twins. They were stirring, but not fussing yet. I smiled at how sweet they looked and how glad I was that they didn't understand what was happening in the big, scary world around them, and I was determined to keep it that way. Tessa startled me when she spoke again. Do you mind if I try to make contact with the negative energy? She looked from me to my mom for signs of approval. We shared a glance, then both nodded to her. She closed her eyes for a moment and took a deep breath before speaking again. Kent, are you here? I shuddered at the mention of his name. Kent, she repeated. We know you are here, and we are telling you that you need to leave. You will not hurt these children like you did the others. She was getting louder and more demanding as she spoke. Leave this house, she bellowed in a forceful voice that I didn't even know she was capable of producing. As if in reply, there was a loud knocking sound just outside the nursery. We rushed into the hallway, and just as Tessa stepped through the doorway, the door slammed shut and locked behind us. New. I shouted as I pushed on the door and twisted the doorknob with all my might with no luck. I started banging on the door, sobbing, damn it, Kent. You get the hell out of here and leave my family alone. I looked to my mom for help. But Tessa pulled me away from the door and further down the hall. What are you doing? My babies are in there. He's going to hurt them. We have to do something. I choked out. My mother was so frozen with fright that she couldn't seem to force herself to move. She just stood outside the nursery, pale, and looking as horrified as I felt. Stop, Quinn, look. Tessa held out the monitor, which was still in her hand. At first, I was so angry I wasn't even sure what I was looking at. The screen was dark at first and was making the static white noise sound again, but when it cleared, I could plainly see what looked to be a dark silhouette standing in front of the window. It was shifting back and forth so quickly, so unnaturally. I grabbed the monitor out of her hand and held it up closer so I could see better. I had forgotten about the record function until just now, but I hastily held down the button until the red light came on. I knew that Bryce would never believe this unless I had proof. Bastard. I muttered under my breath, I could hear the baby screaming, and I couldn't do anything but watch helplessly. I lifted the monitor up to my mouth to scream through the intercom, when Tessa stopped me and said, Look again, Quinn. What else do you see in the room? This was no time for guessing games. My kids' lives were at stake. I begrudgingly glanced down at the monitor, and this time, I did notice something else. Besides the dark, ominous silhouette, there were also two white figures, one in front of each crib. I, I don't know what I'm looking at, I stammered. She reached out and touched my arm gently. You need to know that your grandfather and your husband's grandmother are here. They are guarding and protecting your children. Watch. I stared at the screen in disbelief at her words. But I watched intently, with a lump in my throat and tears in my eyes, as the black figure shifted quickly in the direction of the cribs, just as it did. The light from the two white silhouettes grew in size to where it almost overtook the whole room. I couldn't believe what I heard next. It was hard to make out. But I faintly heard the words protected by love followed by darkness be gone. I recognized the first voice right away this time as Claudia, 
and the second as my papa Everett. I immediately got chills, and started to tears, started streaming down my face. But I stopped dead at the next sound. There was a low growl as the dark figure appeared to shrink and retreat back to the window. I covered my mouth to stifle my gasp. This was definitely the same growl I had heard in my dream of Ken's house. This continued for several moments as the three of us stood and stared. Could this seriously be happening? I didn't think things like this happened in real life. But there it was, right in front of us. Our beloved grandparents were protecting our babies from evil forces in the spirit world. Tessa was the first one to speak after a long silence. May I? she asked, reaching toward the monitor. I handed it to her, trying to wrap my mind around this whole thing. I sank down on the couch next to my still-stunned mother and listened as Tessa clicked the intercom button. Kent, this is your last warning, she bellowed. As you can see, the darkness has no power here. Your soul is free, but you must cross to the light to be forgiven. And with those words, there was one last long growl as the shadow moved across the room towards the cribs and was once again enveloped by the light. But this time, it did not retreat. In fact, the light grew, and grew, and grew until I could see nothing left on the screen, but pure white light. What's happening? I yelled to Tessa, just as the light faded, and the nursery came into view again. The door also flung open. The three of us went running down the hallway. I burst into the room first, and scooped up Hadley. My mom came in right behind me, and picked up Hayden. The room was no longer cold, the air was no longer thick or heavy. For the first time in a long time, there did not seem to be a dark cloud looming over the nursery. While still completely shocked by what had just happened, I was no longer scared. I plopped into the rocking chair, still in shock, as my mom handed Hayden to me, and I began to sob as I cuddled them both to my chest. After I had a few minutes to calm down, I said, I need to call Bryce dot dot dot, he is never going to believe this. Well, I was right about that. After we all stood silently around the nursery for at least a half hour, I made the call to Bryce, he was helping his parents load up the car with things from Claudia's house. With every ring, I felt the nervousness, anxiety, and panic setting in again. How would I even begin to tell him about this without sounding like a crazy person? He picked up on the third ring. I tried to tell him what I had just witnessed. But all I could seem to get out were incoherent words and phrases in between him saying, Wait dot 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 what? And Quinn, slow down. I can't understand what you're saying. He must have gotten the drift that it was important though, because within ten minutes of hanging up with him, he was bursting through our front door. Tessa and I took turns filling him in on details and trying to best explain what we had seen. I could tell Bryce was agitated and wasn't wanting to hear any of it. I finally brought out the monitor and replayed the entire thing so he could see for himself. I watched his expressions carefully. He started out with his brow furrowed, lips pursed obviously unwillingly staring down at the screen. He was just starting to say cut the crap when he finally saw the dark shadow appear in the image. What the dot 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 double quotes he muttered under his breath, he brought the monitor closer for a better view. And just a few short seconds later, we again heard the familiar, faint whisper of the voices. I saw Bryce's face change from disdain to horror and finally to grief as it finally sunk in that he was seeing his grandma's spirit protecting our babies from the evil that had been trying to take them from us. After the video ended, he stared at the blank screen for a while before looking up at me. Tears filling his eyes. How is this possible? He whispered. Quinn, I dot dot dot, I should have listened to you. I'm so sorry I didn't believe you. I wrapped my arms around his shoulders as he broke down into silent sobs. I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to see Tessa, smiling thoughtfully at me. She placed her other hand carefully on Bryce's shoulder 
and spoke to us quietly. Bryce, your grandmother knew her time on Earth was coming to an end. And when she sensed the danger around the children, she knew she couldn't protect them while she was alive. She wants you to know that joining with Quinn's grandfather on the other side to save your babies has fulfilled her unfinished business here. And she can pass over peacefully now, but please know that she won't be far if you ever need her. She has made it her mission to see that her family continues to be safe and taken care. She and Everett say there is no reason to fear any longer. With that, she gave me a quick hug, waved goodbye to my mother, and disappeared out our front door. Other than a few calls over the years to check in, that was the last time we saw Tessa. Besides my mom, none of our other family members ever knew the details of what happened that day. We knew and we understood dot dot dot, and that's all that mattered to us. Claudia's funeral service was beautiful. The church aisles were lined with her to favored flowers. Lilies and roses, Bryce, and I stayed up at the casket after all the visitors had left the visitation. She was dressed in a beautiful lavender silk dress. And she had a smile on her face. We didn't know how to begin to thank her. But even in our grief of losing her, we were so grateful for what she had done for our family. Both when she was living and especially after she left us. We knew she was happy, safe, and at peace. And so were we, finally. After our experience, we kept the video monitor for a little while before trading it in for a traditional one. After all, we figured our babies had the best monitors we could ever ask for. Only handful of times after that day would I catch anything strange, like the rocking chair moving in the nursery on its own. And every time I would just smile and say, Good night, Claudia, we love you. 